if there's a gene that emerges for drought-tolerant people, like there are genes for drought-tolerant crops, then we might expect that gene to be under selection pressure <coughs> because it's children that are going to die during the course of that drought. If they survive to reproductive age because they're carrying the right gene, those genes will be passed to the next generation. <coughs> the possible flu pandemic is slightly out of the news these days, but that doesn't mean the threat of that pandemic has gone away. <coughs> this is one attempt to calculate how many people would die if we re-ran the three major pandemics of the 20th century, the 1918-20 pandemic, which was the most severe, that of 57-58, and 68-70, which were less severe, if the circumstances surrounding those pandemics arose again, then this is an estimate of the number of people that would die under each of those cases. Uh, the worst case, 40 to 50 million people, but in these two cases, many fewer than that. But we could imagine if that many people die, even if the small number of people die, then the, the population that comes out of it at the other end is going to have a different proportion of genes. In other words, it will be an evolved human population. <clears throat> now, the, the idea of genetic engineering is also now being much discussed. But we have to distinguish between two very important differences in kinds of genetic engineering. There's the kind that applies to potentially to cystic fibrosis at the moment, where you don't actually modify the germ line, you don't actually modify the, the, all the genes in an individual so that they can be passed on, those changes can be passed on to the next generation. Rather, you just locate the problem genes where they are, you fix them in situ, you make the genes do what they should have done at birth, and that's the idea behind fixing the problem of cystic fibrosis. The beauty of cystic fibrosis, if there is any beauty to it, is that it's only caused by uh, one gene defect, one principal gene defect, and if you fix that gene defect in situ, in the lungs, then you can make the lungs perform as they're supposed to do, and that will remedy the problem and extend people's lives. But that's not changing the germ line. We can, of course, now change the germ line as well. This is a mouse, a mouse which, when it was an egg, was infected using a virus with a protein called green fluorescent protein, which comes from a jellyfish. And the development of this protein and the exploitation of it was the reason for the award of last year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry, because this is a fantastically useful genetic marker for all sorts of purposes, like following cancer cells around the body to see what they, where they go, what they do, how they reproduce, and so on. But this mouse has that gene in every cell in its body. And that's why when you shine a blue light on that mouse, it glows fluorescent green. Um, another use of this fluorescent protein, incidentally, um, has been in a modern artwork. There's a rabbit called Alba that became famous as the fluorescent bunny. It's a green fluorescent rabbit, which was created by an artist called Eduardo Katz, and he used that as the development of art. Um, there have been strong objections to it because the rabbit didn't live very long. Um, however, the, the, the technology is there to change the germ line at the moment in a way that would apply to all future generations. Now, we're no, nowhere near, of course, to doing that with humans. Ethically, it's completely unacceptable, and there are lots of technical problems with it as well. But think 100 years down the line and imagine what might happen. A point that I want to make, though, about changing the germline is this, that if we want to fix genetic diseases, what you need to remember is that there are very few important genetic diseases of humans that are caused by only one malfunctioning gene. And the reason, of course, is that natural selection has already got rid of them all. So all that work has been done. The easy work's been done by natural selection. And in terms of genetic medicine, we're now left with a difficult problem. And the difficult problem is that most diseases that have a genetic association have a genetic association that's based on lots of different kinds of genes with different functions interacting with the environment in different ways. And it's going to be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to fix those kinds of genes. Now, thinking a long way further into the future, many people have imagined where human beings are trying to go and where they're evolving. Um, one of the world's most well-known uh, self-advertising futurologists, Ray Kurzweil, has imagined 
that if you an opened up Angelina Joni, Jolie, there's quite a lot of people who'd like to know what's inside Angelina Jolie. Um, this is fantasy artwork uh, about the idea that a person would be some kind of cyborg, cyborg, part flesh, part human, part machine. Um, but this is nothing more than an idea on a drawing board at the moment. The real business of creating cyborgs is on the right-hand side here, and I picked this example more or less at random. It's in Nature this week, actually. I picked it because it's not really my field, but I thought it was a, really a very beautiful example of the manufacture of a molecular machine. What these researchers did, what you see on the right-hand side here, is an axle, a molecular axle, with a molecular wheel on it. And the molecular wheel turns on the molecular axle. And it's in nature because now you can make those things. What you do with it, nobody has any idea. But you can do it with molecular surgery, with molecular engineering of this kind. And that's where the development of cyborgs is really going to come from, if it's going to come from uh, anywhere. And the purpose of this, of course, is to do what I suggested at the beginning, that medicine might do. Medicine is there in some sense, to stop evolution from happening. So these kinds of cyborgs are people who would be able to take parts from different places and solve the problem of the survival of the fittest. So here's the bottom line. Um, evolution is going on. It's probably going on by a mixture of natural selection, sexual selection, genetic drift. We can't measure the intensity of it very accurately. We don't know how quickly it's happening. And we also don't know where we're going with it. Um, here are two experts on the future of human evolution. Here's Jeffrey Miller at the top, rather more optimistically in a thousand years, more, will be more beautiful, intelligent, symmetrical, healthy, and all that will happen because of 40 generations of genetic screaming against harmful mutations. Daniel Dennett, philosopher at the bottom here, who seems to have presented himself as Darwin's current representative on Earth, uh, has said, perhaps in a moment of earthiness, that he imagined that humans will become a hardy remnant of the current version of our species, species which can survive on earthworms while living in underground burrows. And you can be sure that when two leading evolutionary biologists in the field have such strongly opposing views about where we're going, that we have very little idea where we're taking evolution or where evolution is taking us. Thanks for listening. Thank well, thank you once again, Chris, for an absolutely superb um, presentation. You said just have a question. Um, are humans still evolving? Yes, I think you've persuaded every one of us um, that our race is um, evolving. And I think anyone who goes out of here thinking, let's listen to the creationists um, out there, I must go down and say, listen to what is actually happening. Watch what is happening at the present time. And um, you chose the example of um, resistance in bacteria. Um, you could think also of the example of resistance in um, insects to insecticides, um, the moths that have changed colour under selection from pollution. Um, the story is going on and on and on. And to my mind, there is no question whatsoever um, that evolution is progressing. Now, Chris has the major problem here is that should we interfere with it? And I think the biggest problem is raised in the last one at the moment is that if we screen out these harmful mutations, they're the ones that we think now, in this first half of the 21st century, are harmless, harmful. We don't know that we might be screening out mutations which in a thousand years' time um, might be useful. Now, unfortunately, we come to the end of the time. It's very, very rare here, so there wouldn't be no questions today. But Chris will be around for a moment or so. He'll also be around on the 23rd of April when he'll ask one of the most important questions of the whole lot. And this is one supplied to Gresham College. Um, how many um, people can the world um, hold? Um, and our problem always here is how many people can Gresham College actually accommodate? So you'll come back in a full circle um, to the origins. It's exactly the same question. Um, are there too many of us on the earth and are there too many of us who want to come to lectures um, like Chris's? Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks very much.